Welcome to another episode of Inspire People Impact Lives. And I am your host, Josh Kosnick. And by trade, I am a financial advisor and by training, now a leader and managing partner at Northwestern Mutual. And today I have a special guest in Beth Prohaska, Executive Vice President at Potter Lawson, the architect firm which has designed or helped design some of the city's most recognized building here, buildings here in Madison, such as the Monona Terrace, the Overture Center, and University Square. So after joining Potter Lawson as a receptionist 39 years ago, Beth has worked her way through the firm, working in each department before becoming the first female stockholder at Potter Lawson, while also being a non-technical architectural prof- professional. Potter Lawson is arguably Madison's most iconic and influential architecture firm, and her passion, dedication, and motivation resulted in her paving the way for women being leaders in the architecture industry. So with that being said, Beth, welcome to the show. Great. Glad to be here. <laughs> so excited to have you. So I want to start with a little bit of context, because not only is Potter Lawson great at designing I- iconic architecture, but you guys have also done a great job at designing and building powerful teams. And uh, and those create those teams have created some great masterpieces here in our city. So excited to talk to you today about the culture at Potter Lawson and the things you've uh, implemented to create the, that culture. But first, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, so... Uh... I live in Madison, uh, Middleton actually, was born and raised. We lived out in the country years ago because I wanted horses, so my family, oh, stop! (laughs) I'm so sorry. It's all right. Phone or watch? (laughs) My watch. (laughs) (laughs) My watch, I turned off my phone. Okay, okay. (laughs) Sorry about that. So just start with the, so lived in Madison, go from there. Okay. Lived in Madison, moved out to Mount Horeb because I was a horse lover and had all kinds of animals out there uh, and stayed out there until my daughter started kindergarten. At the time, I was a single mom, and it's pretty lonely living in the country when you're a kid. So when she started kindergarten, I moved back into town um, so she could have friends and be with with other people and uh, never looked back. I love it. That's great. So 39 years, starting from receptionist, now all the way to executive vice president. Yeah. Can you touch on a little bit of your uh, journey along that path there? Yeah, it was great. Um, I originally applied for a job. I wasn't even I hadn't even finished school yet, um, but I instantly fell in love with it. I started as a receptionist. Jim Potter was there, and Jim, um, after I got the job, I realized I'd gone through Toastmasters with my dad, so we had a connection. And he was I was blessed to have wonderful mentors in Jim Potter and Dave Lawson. They had a huge impact on my life, uh, and they always encouraged me to do more. And I was there six months. At, they joked, it's still in my file, at my six-month review, um, they said, what do you think that you could do different, and what are your goals? And I looked at him straight-faced and said, look, I'm going to take your job someday, and I'm going to do it a lot better than you do. <laughs> <laughs> what was his face like when he said that? He laughed. He yeah. laughed. Times were a lot different 40 years ago. Uh, there was a lot more chauvinism, and the glass ceiling was a real thing. Yeah. So uh, I didn't even think about it. It just came out. Yeah. So it was a real laugh. Like, he did not believe you at that time? No, I think he believed me. I think he was just shocked that I said it. Okay. That's cool. <laughs> no, that's cool. And it's interesting uh, in, in getting to know you and knowing you a little bit about your background. My COO, Chief Operations Officer, Haley, started as our receptionist which now getting to know her is like, I can't believe you were ever a receptionist underneath my father way back when. Right. Because she's got a very direct form of uh, communication, not as bubbly, hates hugs, but uh, is an awesome, awesome chief operations officer. And so it's it's funny that you're talking about this story. And by the way, on audio, if you get these ropes banging against the windows, they are uh, washing our windows today. So we're going to have to do We can't cut that noise out. So sorry about that. But the windows are clean. But the windows are clean. So that's good. So can you describe your organization structure, what that's like now, and maybe what it was way back when, kind of how that's evolved? Sure. Uh, 40 years ago, it was very different. It was very... Um, the principals guided everything. They really drove and control everything. It was much more controlling. Uh, people came in. We were all we're all baby boomers back then. So you know, 50, 60 hour week was normal. But if we started at eight, we were all there at seven thirty, so we could get coffee, put our lunch away, and be at our desk sitting at eight o'clock. I remembered things like um, I was always chatty and standing at the copy machine talking about someone who had gotten married the next 
the weekend before and my boss coming and pounding his fists on the copier saying there's way too much bullshit in the office, get back to work. <laughs> that kind of stuff was very normal. Um, it was kind of fear-based, but it was effective. It was yeah. effective. Uh, then moving into the 80s and 90s, um, you got to remember, there weren't podcasts like this then. Right. There weren't webinars. You couldn't go on Google and find anything out. So you'd go to seminars and conferences, and they'd gone to a conference, and empowerment was the big thing. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, we're going to empower people. And uh, that was just changing when they, the principals used to be the, it was a good old boys club, they'd get the work they could see things were starting to change. So they came back from a conference and called me into a conference room and said, look, empowerment is really important. And we want you to teach our technical staff how to bring in more work so we don't have to do it all ourselves. I'm like, oh, didn't have any idea where this was going. And they're like, so we're empowering you to do that. Just check with us before you do anything, which I couldn't help but I just boldface laughed right there in the meeting. And I think they they got it. So, so that, we're empowering you, but no, check first. Yep. You're empowered, but don't do anything without permission. So, you know, that's <laughs> interesting. Yeah, that, uh, so w- that's the culture that I was raised and grew up in. And then moving forward, you kind of take, just like how you parent, you either you take what you like and you don't like from your childhood, and that's what you do with your kids. Yeah. So um, I took what I liked and didn't like and what was effective in learning, and I've moved that now because what worked then would not work at all anymore. So our culture is very, very different. Yeah. So now, well, how do you feel or how would you describe the culture then in the organiz- organizational design versus that fist pounding my way or the highway yeah. style? Yeah. Yeah. We're much more open and collaborative. Um, you know, I don't ever joke when people say, how do you find people and what's your leadership style? I always say it's really simple. I just hire people that are a lot smarter than me and the bar isn't very high there. So it's easy to do. But all kidding aside, I don't ever pretend that I have all the answers. And I think that's a a strength. The whole Me Too movement has raised a lot of awareness is women in business. Mm -hmm. 40 years ago, there were very few women in the construction industry. And the ones that were there were administrative staff or interior designers. Mm -hmm. Um, what What they were lacking was the softness and intuition that women bring to the table. Um, I don't have, I don't pretend that I, I never pretend that I'm a, a licensed architect at all. I'm a really solid businesswoman. And so the skill set that I bring to the table is I don't pretend I have all the answers, but I've, I have really, really good people in place. And together, we come up with really great ideas. Good. That's, that's a really good description. So I want to go back to the receptionist all the way to where you're at now. Yeah. And that example because I want I know there's some uh, millennial listeners uh, to our podcast as well. Do you think someone can do that now? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Because I, I think, and I, we, we hear a lot about the millennials joining that workforce now and how we have to change and evolve and or, or how we already have changed and evolved as companies. Um, but what's interesting about that is there are, there's a perception be, because there is, a lot of people coming out of college thinking they deserve something or a title or a certain thing that they may not have earned yet, or they won't take a certain job because they feel like it's beneath them with the degree that they got. What do you, what do you think about that? So there are, so let's stop back just for a second to millennials. Um, you know, as a boomer, I remember when some of those, them were coming on the scene, we kind of looked at them and like, gosh, they're lazy and you heard all that stuff. But when you really drill down into it, they're not. Mm-mm. They just work differently. Yeah. They work a lot differently. And I look at how the hours that we used to work, I mean, there's still times now where we have to work a lot of hours, but they're more let's work smarter and more collaborative and not work a lot of hours. So they're much better at having work life balance. Mm-hmm. So they're not bad. They're just different. And yeah. you need to harness that. Um, I just lost my train of thought. No, that's all right. I totally agree with you. So you're talking about how they work differently. And I was asking you about how. Uh, going from receptionist to executive vice president, and can that still happen? Um, so for the millennials coming out of school, do they, I guess my, my thought is letting them know that whether it's a title of receptionist or whether it's a title of VP of banking or whatever it may be, hard work, perseverance, and your good work is always going to shine through and you'll get promotions because of that. So don't be afraid to 
start at receptionist or wherever it may be to get paid and start paying off some of those student loans right. first before waiting for that perfect title or perfect role. Right. There are people, we do, we do a lot of interviewing. We probably interview 15 to 20 people before we'll extend an offer to somebody. Um, and there are people that just culturally aren't a good fit. We've interviewed people right out of school that say, I need to make this amount of money. And by the way, what's the path to ownership and how long will it take to get there? We just don't hire those people. So I can only speak to what we have in our office, in our culture, and the millennials that are in our office. And they're, I'm telling you, they're phenomenal. They inspire me each and every day. And one of the things is I spend a lot more time mentoring now. I'm realizing that I get a lot more out of mentoring those people I think, then they get out of it. It's a win-win. Sometimes mm -hmm. I'm the mentor, sometimes I'm the intern, and that's phenomenal. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I love, that's the biggest reason I got into leadership because yeah. I was finding more joy in developing people and yeah. learning along the way. Yeah. And like, uh, and someone you know, and Carl, when he first came into this business, he challenged me in ways like I was laying there on Sunday night, like he was doing so well. Sunday night, Monday morning, coming into a meeting with him, I was like, what am I going to teach him today? Like I was educating myself. I was like, I feel like he's already got this. And so there's people like that that are going to, you hire the right people that are really smart and really talented that are going to force you to level up. And I know that's what he did for me in my leadership game. And many others have done that along the way since then. Yeah. So I really like what you said there. So speaking of hiring, and now you're hiring almost all millennials and now Gen Z beyond, behind that, uh, what do you look for when you're hiring people? So obviously, um, first and foremost, they have to have good qualifications technically. But as important, sometimes more important, is personality. They have to have passion for what they do. Um, you know, one of the little things that I say is you can teach a monkey a new skill, but you can't teach it to not be a monkey. So personality is really important. We are, we are so collaborative. Our office is completely off, open. We don't have partitions at all. It's tabletop height. Mm -hmm. So you, it forces, doesn't force, it enables good communication. And if you have someone that comes in with a big ego or a hot temper, it's going to be the rotten apple that spoils the whole thing. So we hire really good people that are collaborative and fit in our culture. How do you test for that? Or how do you interview for that? <clears throat> That's again where I think being a woman is um, gives me the edge over a lot of people. We don't do personality disc profile tests. We don't do any of that. We have conversations with people and ask them weird questions. Like so I might ask someone, what are you most proud of in your life? Or you know, where have you had a biggest failure? And how did it make you feel? And what will you do different? You learn so much about people when you ask them off the wall questions, not technical questions about what they're doing today. Oh, that's really good. So, what would be a good example of someone when you ask, "What are you most proud of?" versus a bad example? Well, sometimes it depends on the passion that comes through. Sometimes what I'm looking for is true, honest passion. Um, for instance, uh, about 10 years ago, uh, I was at a seminar on technology and I sat next to a guy uh, that owned his, he owned a framing firm for a residential. Kind of in our industry, not really. Um, by accident, he stole my dessert, which is like a big no-no if you know me and my sweet tooth. <laughs> uh, so we got into this banter back and forth, and he handled it really well. But yet there was something so honest and humble about him with his personality. He was just a good, really, really good, honest human being. Uh, at the end of the uh, conference, we exchanged business cards because that's what you do. And I, I kept thinking about him. About a month later, I called him when we went to lunch. And my intuition, I, I said, we, he needs to be on our team, even though we didn't have a need for someone like that on our team. Took a couple of months to convince him to to leave his business and join our team, but he did, uh, and it was never a mistake. I remember going in and telling my partner, I just hired this guy for construction administrator, and he was like, huh? Like, no, trust me, we need this guy. He's going to be good. Um, fast forward 10 years, in January, we made him one of our new partners in our succession plan, and it, uh, it was one of the greatest things that we've done is to bring him on board. That's awesome. Has he ever stolen your dessert since? <laughs> uh, no, no, but we talk <laughs> about it. <laughs> That's great. So you say you're not in the architect or architectural business, but yeah. rather in the relationship business. What does that mean to you? Okay, we live or die on our reputation. 
and that's built on relationships. Um, there are a lot of really, really good architectural firms in the area. They all do good design. Where you know, it's like restaurants in Madison. There's no shortage of good restaurants. Yeah. There's some really good firms. What we have is a passion for not only good design, but helping our clients succeed. If our clients, if we can help our clients get a competitive advantage over their competition, we've won. That's like a, a huge win. And when our clients are happy, they tell uh, their friends, their colleagues, so it leads to more work. So we work really hard to develop, develop long-term relationships with our clients, with our consultants, with contractors, with suppliers, everybody. And that's led to over 85% of our work is repeat clients or client recommendations. Selfishly, that's the easy button for me is the whale hunter in the office. It, it makes my life easier, but it just makes a lot of sense, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So much business sense. And we were in a financial advising business where it's all driven upon referral. So yeah. if you're a happy um, advisor in our world or a happy architect or employee at Potter, Potter Lawson, you're going to engage a happier client more likely as well. Yep. It's, it's similar to the principles that Costco employs with having happy employees and treating them right yeah. so that they treat us right and keep us coming back. Yeah, that's true. My son's a Costco employee and he loves it there. I actually didn't know that. I was just going to say, I, I think I've admitted to my Costco addiction before on previous right. podcasts. So. Yep. I think that's why he got a job there because we were there a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's like, oh, Josh, where'd you get that Costco? I don't ever have like a different answer. No, right. And my bill is always bigger than my wife's bill when I come back from it because I wander into it. If different... you put one thing in your cart, you're not leaving for under 100 bucks. No. It's no. magic. No, and I always come home with the most random things. Like uh, my wife's really good about it. So she goes with four kids uh, and denies them toys, slip and slide, whatever. So I come home the next day that I had to, and it wasn't the next day, but the next time I went to Costco, I came back with a slip and slide they asked for. I didn't know it. She goes, I told them no on that. I was like, well, I, but I, it's thought, cool. I thought it was cool. <laughs> so they hooked me. Maybe I wanted to play with it versus them. Probably a little bit of that. So uh, you say your goal is to hire really smart people, also the really relational people. Um, is there anything structured outside of your process that we want to talk about, talk about or dive into besides your just gut intuition that could be applicable to our audience that maybe not be a female or have your special skill set? No, I, I honestly, I, I wish I could tell you that we have this big formal process with all these tests and all this stuff. We don't. I took over hiring over 20 years ago, uh, partly because it was a trial and error. Uh, we used to have someone else that did the hiring, but he was a very introverted, technical person. And then we would hire people like him and then be frustrated when they couldn't relate to clients or you couldn't take them into an interview. And I'm like, this is crazy. If you want Zip, you got to hire Zip. Yeah. So have you made a mistake? Maybe let's go there and hiring. Sure. And, sure. And how did you deal with that or how quickly did you deal with that? Because I think we all do. Sure. And and people can fool us throughout the interview process. Yep. And then they get into your culture and they're not a fit for whatever reason. How have you dealt with that? Oh, then you got to make room for them to um, make their services available to the industry. <laughs> yeah. So they can go work somewhere else. Yeah, I like we, it when those people go work for a competitor. Yeah. And maybe it's a perfect fit for that competitor. Right. And that's similar here as I, I've taught our recruiting team and the people that help in that is like, if they choose a competitor over us, that means they aligned with that culture better, which means they wouldn't have been a good culture fit here. Right. And that's perfectly okay. Yeah. We're not going to try and plug a square peg into a round hole. Right. So I think mentality-wise, I think a lot of people need to adopt that. So is there a time frame that you give it to see if it fits in or that person fits in? No, we have a the typical 90-day probationary period. But a lot of times it doesn't rear its head, in, in our opinion, and it doesn't happen very often. It usually happens, uh, it's longer than that. It's yeah. more like, you know, in the first year that it shows up. Yeah, I, I would agree. Someone asked me that the other day, and I was like, I think I know who I have within six months. Yeah. As, as if they're going to make it or not, or if they're exhibiting the right traits to, of progress. Yeah, we really don't have, we really don't have a lot of it, though, we fire very, very few people. We really don't. Sometimes people need a little bit more coaching mm -hmm. and then and then they get there, but we really have good people. Yeah, that's really good. So uh, I know you and Chad spoke, so he talked about this term of bureaucracy because we hire fully formed adults. 
Yeah. So tell us about that. So, you know, when you're a grown ass adult and you come, oh, sure, I shouldn't swear. You're okay. When you're, when you're a grown up <laughs> uh, and we're all professionals, you know, most of our people have, you know, bachelor's and master's degrees and they're, they're pretty grown up. And then we start with communication and we tell them what our expectations and our values and our goals are and they can see it when they come in and they see how other people act with, with clients, um, it's not a big deal. We don't need a lot of bureaucracy. We just don't. Don't, don't get me wrong. We have a, a, an office policy manual that we go through during the orientation process so people know that. So if we, we have something, if we have to go back and say, hey, this isn't allowed, it's in our office policy manual, but most of the time we don't have to ever get there. And in, in that office, do you lay out mission and vision? For powder lesson? No, no, no. We talk about more policy and procedures. Okay. Do you guys have mission and vision? We do. We did it. Uh, you know, Eric and I worked on strategic <clears throat> planning. It's probably thirty years at least old, twenty five years old, um, and it's you know personally we don't believe in having a you know a strategic plan every you do it every year and you update it and then you put it in a binder and it sits on the shelf until you do it the next year we are very nimble as an organization so we can steer and go where the market goes so our mission is you know really simple do good work have fun and make money it's a great vision or mission i should say it's pretty simple yeah, yeah. and i think any business could apply that right I think I think the hardest piece there is actually having fun, because so yeah. many in an office yeah. environment, I think that uh, that that tends to be hard, especially for people in a, like a management role. Yeah. Is what's the striking a balance that we find? Yeah. You know, so even so, we had our uh, leadership team, um, our internship leadership team this summer, put in a ping pong table and, and a door basketball hoop on the internship room, and so then they're debating a month later. Is there too much of that going on versus the actual work? And so it's just kind of a fine balance in making sure that people are having fun, but also getting their job done. Does it work? You know, it's in beta. <laughs> like we're figuring that out. Yeah. It's like, so we have some offices attached to that. And, uh, and because one of the intern leaders is there and he's a full-time advisor that helps with that. And he's, he's like, I hear the basketball hoop going on a lot. <laughs> so I'm wondering if the... Uh, uh, because his wall backs up to it. So he's like, I'm wondering if the actual phoning and conversating on learning is getting done. Yeah, since we do a lot of corporate work, you know, we hear about all the buzz that's going through on what to do. I remember not long ago, uh, maybe it was longer than I think ago, when nap rooms were a thing because they said, employees are more productive if they have a nap. I can tell you that's not going to happen on my watch at the office. We are not having a nap room. You don't get the nap pods like at Google? No, and no we're not doing that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that may be true. I mean, the, the, I think that principle comes from Europe, right, where they have siesta times. Because I remember being in Italy and like over that lunch period or just after when a lot of the businesses closed yep. and you're like, well, guess we got to go see another site for a while because we can't get into any of the right stores yeah uh, so but that's interesting so i think it applies over over that time so how much autonomy are you really giving so we're not doing nap time at powder loss no we're not but uh, uh how much autonomy are you giving them and are there processes in place and let them run with the new ideas or are you guys kind of directing those flows so you know we have policies and procedures like every solid company does but people know when they have leeway you know we we do the funny word empower you know we do let people have leeway if they really think it's the right thing as long as it's not you know, i'm going to commit the firm to, to a ten thousand dollar change on a project that would be a no-no but within reason people know that they have leeway that's good so that's really good so how does it look like for them to um how does that empowerment, I guess, look like for building great teams? Because you guys have really done that. And I know you have your daughter now involved. Yeah. And so she's considered millennial as well. So yep. transitioning that baby boomer down to the millennial, how have you guys built such a great team? In your um, opinion, I guess. So I think great teams are built on um, respect and honesty and trust. I think those are the three things. Without those three, I think it's really hard to have a good team. Um, the one component that uh, one of my personal goals is to get better on is have more fun um, at work. And I that's probably, if you look at how a lot of things are driven top down, both Eric and 
I are more serious. Doug is a hoot. He's like the warmest, fuzziest, kindest person you've ever met in the world. Um, oh, shoot. I hope you edit that part out. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you don't want him to know that? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, but uh, I, I, my goal is to try and have a little bit more fun in the office with people. I tend to run a little bit more serious, especially when I'm busy. Life's too short to be serious about everything, but I get so laser focused that I forget to stop and laugh. Yeah. Well, that's good. So how, when you add someone new to the team, how do you think they incorporate to the respect and trust and honesty? I think they, they, they come in and it's just really, you can feel it when you come in the, when in the office, we have a, an orientation process, which is good. It's always in constant improvement. Uh, last year I met with four of our new employees and said, Hey, how did you think our entoy, empl- uh, orientation process went and what could we do to do it better and they had a couple of tweaks but bottom line they said it was it was pretty good that said we we did make some tweaks our new um our three new partners came up with some really fantastic ideas to make that even better um they're all you know younger so that was good but they come in and they feel it right away so curious question and that this you weren't prepped for this but it is familial so what do you think made your daughter want to join you and your firm not that I don't have any personal family uh, ties like that, because I joined my dad's firm, so I'm joking, of course. But why do you think Rebecca wanted to join you and follow in your footsteps? Well, oddly enough, um, we have a history of that. Ellis Potter was one of the founders, and Jim Potter was his son. And then Dave Lawson um, joined in 1964, who was a mentor that had a huge impact on my life, who was one of the most amazing businessmen I have ever ever known in my life Um, his son Eric joined who's also equally as phenomenal and they're like family so um, I didn't even think about it when Rebecca joined it seemed natural but I think she's she's always said she wanted to do that because she came in you know as a as a as a baby boomer I worked a lot more then so she would come in nights and weekends and help me pull together proposals and do stuff. And when she got in high school, when we had, would have like a receptionist or administrative person go on vacation instead of hiring a temp, she would come in because she knew she knew so much. So it was just a natural fit for her. And so she was exposed to the culture in a good way. Yeah. Through trial and error and just over time, just being around you. Yeah. Yeah. So have you worked through any challenges in that being a mom, but also boss so I think probably the hardest so when right when when I brought her on board you know because she was right out of college I said this is either going to work or it's we blew we broke all the rules probably like you and Steve not only did she work for me she was a direct report so you're never supposed to do that if you hire your kids have them report to somebody else we blew those rules and I said it's either going to work or it's going to be a miserable failure and if it doesn't work, you got to go because I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> um, it worked beyond my wildest dreams. Um, Rebecca is intelligent. She's one of the smartest women that I know. She's funny. She's so funny. Um, and she's got a really good business sense. So we work really, really well together. There's a, a trust that you have when it's a family member that you don't, that it's natural, mm-hmm. that you don't always have with any, anybody else. So... It's been, a, she's been a great ad. She brings a lot of, of new ideas and diversity to our team. Did you have to, and I'm speaking from experience and asking these questions because it's sometimes very hard to work with family as well, but did you guys have to create any boundaries or for that or did it seamlessly work from the get-go? It did. You know, I told her right at the beginning, um, you know, you're, you're going to, you have different rules than everybody else because everybody's going to expect um, nepotism. Mm-hmm. So you have to be there earlier than anybody else and you have to work a little bit harder just to be even to prove yourself and then we'll see where this goes well she did she did work hard she's become you know the go-to for you know before she was a partner to my partners on things on technology and a lot of things so she's earned her way it wasn't a given that she was going to get where she is today she earned her way she's done a really good job that's great yeah. That's awesome because I always, and I'm sure she felt this as well, but I always felt like I had a red target on my back Yeah, uh, because of my last name. She did, um, but I'm sure your dad told you that you had that target there. Oh, he said it from the get-go. Yeah. Because when I called, he never recruited me when I called here because I was at Best Buy at the time and I got told, told no for a raise. And I said, I want to do what you you do. Yeah. I don't want to, I want to be in control of what I make. And he goes, well, all right, 
you're going to have to go through like everything else. And it's going to be twice as hard because of your last name. And I said, okay. And went through it all. And, and it was not always smooth and easy. Um, and there was times where uh, we got into yelling matches behind closed doors because of my and his bullheaded personalities. But uh, overall, became a great fit to work together. And, and he was more of that slam your fist like you mentioned back before. And I'm far more collaborative. So what I learned to do over the last few years of, uh, of our relationship in, that, in, this, in this office was I had to make things his idea. So I got really good at making things his idea. Oh, I wonder like, if Rebecca does that. <laughs> <laughs> now you're going to question. Like, so do you take any of what he learned? Have you changed how you are to I incorporate think, that now that you're sitting at the top? Yeah. So I think that, uh, like you mentioned earlier, with um, having kids and, and, and adopting what, how your parents raised you and what you liked yeah. and didn't like yeah. uh, versus uh, uh, how you raise your own kids, I think there's been some... That, that, that resonated with me a lot because he was so directive in his way or the highway. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's what the organization needed when he took over, uh, that as it evolved and with the millennials uh, coming in in droves, it had to be far more collaborative. Yeah. And so there are certain instances and there'll be some times where I have to realize that I do need to be directive versus collaborative because now my bias is to be collaborative but there are times when you do have to step into that directive role because that's what people want and need from you as a leader yep. so i think back to his like there's some things that he would just beat into our heads uh and and we would mock him for it well now knowing is that your message is being received when you start getting mocked as a leader and so like my brother and i or even some other leaders in the firm we still mock steve because there are things that were worked so well that we have to can hey remember how well that worked we need to go back to that and and kind of start mocking steve kosnick again and that adage that he was using because it it works yeah he was good so so it's funny like thinking back that and you asking that question but I, I think about the parenting style and how he raised me and and so that question why so i was talking to our interns this morning about why you do what you do and developing your personal why because it'll pull you through those really shitty days yeah see i swore too so now we're now we're even okay on good the podcast. so <laughs> so um so pulling you through those really bad days is having that really personal why why yeah. you're going to go through getting hung up on or why you're going to uh, go through something bad happening to you and so i was thinking about that sometimes as a child my dad would tell me to do something and i'd be like yeah but why and he'd be like because i said so <laughs> and i was like <laughs> I'm thinking back to myself, like, I respect you as my father, but that's not a real reason. Like, so I've always now, I'm the opposite of that. If my kids ever ask me why, if someone, if one of my employees ever asked me why, I always give an answer. Because there's always a reason, and I never want it to be, because I said so, damn it. Like, that was my dad to me. I always hated that. So now I'm the opposite. I was like, I'm always going to explain it if you ask the question. Yeah. And I'll warn people that in interviews, like, if you ever want to know why, I will give you that answer, but I'll give you a little bit of a hint. It's always going to do with, uh, typically, with keeping you around long term and building those habits that keep you around long term. Yeah. Probably the only struggle we had is um, a mother and a daughter working together was not calling me mom at work. (laughs) For the first couple weeks, it would be like, "Mm, Beth? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. That actually, that I could uh, identify with that too. Right. Yeah. So like, it's, it's just weird because you go call someone mom or dad uh, all your life, and then you get in the office, and everyone else knows them as Steve or Beth or. Right. So here. do you call them Steve outside of work now? No. No. Uh, yeah. No. no. So it goes back to dad outside yeah. of work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's good. So switching gears, um, how do you keep? Uh, you say you need to have more fun. You personally. Yeah. But how do How do you empower others, or how do you keep the morale up? around the office so i think um i don't here's another thing where i say i don't have all the answers you know we 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 did a climate survey last year for staff random questions about what do you like about our culture what do we need to improve what do you think about this and one of the things is they want more social time together and i said what does that look like and they said well we want to have um happy hour in the office once a month like that's an easy thing to do. So we just bring in whatever. And our, sometimes they'll say, we're going to have a mojito happy hour. You know, there's a, usually a little bit of a theme. But what they're saying is they just want to let their hair down and have fun together as a staff. And 
we could go, we could say we're going to go to a bar. I don't care where we go, but they want to do it at the office, which tells you they really like being there. Mm -hmm. We've even said for holiday parties, we'll go anywhere. We used to go to country clubs and have formal dinners and we've gone to all different kinds of things. And two years in a row, they said, let's just cater stuff in and have our wives come to the office and have it here. Like crazy, right? Yeah. But that's where they want to be because they like it there. So we try and do more stuff like that. We do um, some team building stuff, not what you think is traditional team building. One of our signature projects that we um, did that was started by staff was uh, is a fund drive for the Second Harvest Food Bank. We started, I think this is our 28th or 29th year of doing it. <clears throat> and it was our staff came up with the idea, hey, we want to do this as a team to give back to the community. Well, what we started turned into the Share Your Holidays food drive that's by NBC 15, yeah. Channel 15. That started with Mike McKinney coming to our office and covering it, and he was so inspired. He went, I know how I can take this to the next le level. And Channel 15 is what developed it to what it is today. So 28 years later, 29 years later, our still team still loves that event, and we have friendly teams in the office with competitions and it's it's great fun and doing good for the community feels good so yeah. that's that's a lot of fun and yeah thank you for your work there yes yeah. that's, that's been awesome then known about it for a long time so we often hear leaders say treat how treat others how you want to be treated yeah and that's called the golden rule but now i think the platinum rule applies much further which is treat people how they want to be treated right and uh, how are you doing that and I, I also want this to lead to our conversation about the glass ceiling that you broke through and are trying to help others break through yeah. as well. So how, when I say that, what goes through your mind? Which, the glass ceiling or treat people how treat I want to be treated? Treat people how they want to be treated, the platinum rule, and then we'll go into the glass ceiling part. So I'm very um, direct and I like open and honesty. I'm the person that you say, you know, does these jeans look good on me? If you don't want to know, don't ask me. Because if <laughs> I ask you, I want an honest answer, right? But I've learned probably the hard way that not everybody wants that brutal honesty. So I've learned to, um, for instance, I, I still believe in praise publicly, criticize privately. So if yeah, someone's great. done something wrong, I always bring them in the office, close the door or outside of the office and have a one-on-one -on -one feedback session. Um, that said, not everybody's comfortable with public praise be it in a Monday morning email or an attaboy at a meeting or walking out and saying, hey, great job. Not everybody's comfortable with that. And I've learned that the hard way. Uh, so sometimes now I'll just, you know, just a little bit, hey, good job on that. And that's all they want. Yeah. So you have to be reach people in their comfort zone in their world. Yeah, no, I, I really agree with that. So let's talk about the glass ceiling is because you clearly broke through that. And now you're empowering others to break through that. So what do you think was key for you? And I think you spoke to it a little bit earlier with the mentors, but um, yeah, what do you think was key for you? That's a really good question. Um, you know, I when I was going through this, everybody, you'd hear, oh, it's the glass ceiling. Oh, it's really made of Lexan. You can't break through it. And I've always kind of went, I don't get that. I don't get that. I think people need to look at you. And, and, and Jim and Dave didn't look at me as a woman, like, oh, we want to get a woman on our team. We want diversity. They looked at, at me as a person, and they believed in me and coached and mentored me so I could go where I wanted to go. So while I understand um, the glass ceiling, I think that personally, I don't think it's as bad now as it used to be, totally. I think the Me Too movement didn't do personally the stuff that went on that was bad, but I think one of the unintended consequences of that is it now makes uh, some men uncomfortable to have one-on-one -on -one relationships mm -hmm. with, with women. Um, and I think that that's unfortunate. I think that that's going to backfire a little bit. Um, but I think now is a really great time to be a woman in business because people are realizing that we bring a whole nother set of intuition and a softness to the management style uh, that not a lot of people had before. Do you know that I th all of that is really good? And I think that people should listen to that last I don't know, minute and a half or whatever that was in, in on repeat. But uh, so do you think, or uh, let me ask this, how many percentage are, of the architects are women? We're about 40% women now. Really? Mm -hmm. That's more than I would have thought. 
Mm -hmm. what, what, what was it when you started, do you know? Oh, uh, the only women in the office were in the front office. There weren't any women in the technical side at all. Interesting. And when I'm saying people, and I'm talking office as a whole, we're... we're Your office. Do you know what office. it is industry-wide? No. Okay. Yeah. So the financial advising world is pretty atrocious. I think it's 18% industry-wide. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Huh. Yeah. So, but what's interesting about those, eighty-one percent of women surveyed would prefer to work with a woman. So, like we can in, in our office, we're uh, about thirty percent. So we're still working to get to get where we should because you know, societally we're fifty-fifty. But I also have found that uh, universities aren't necessarily doing us any favors. Um, and I don't know if you see this in the architectural field where. The women are still getting pushed towards what are uh, deemed to be more nurturing roles, yeah. uh, nursing, teaching, stuff of this nature, where I don't think there's much more of a nurturing role than being an advisor uh, because of the emotional stuff that we deal with. But, Absolutely. But we're not getting paid any favors from the traditional education setting. And I don't know if you're experiencing that in the architectural field because it's not been a traditional woman womanly role, kind of like our world. Huge, huge. I can remember... Um, as a woman trying to get ahead, I started looking way back when, and why is it that women go to, the girls go to home ec and guys go to fitness? Or and the, shop or whatever. Or yeah. shop, yeah. Why don't why don't women go to shop or then girls? Why don't girls go to take the higher level math class? Why is that, that they're encouraged to go this way? So early on, um, I would send my daughter, and instead of going to summer camp at the Y, she went to um, like entrepreneurial camp at the university. She went to chemi chemistry camp at the university. She went to math camp at the university. So I tried to give her those things. Like, get out there. Don't don't be like how I was raised, where I still need a calculator to balance my checkbook. <laughs> Learn those things. Have harder skills like that. And she's a rock star at that stuff. And what, what did you find when you were pushing her towards that? What did she come back with feedback from you? Or she from, yeah. loved it. She loved it. Of course... You know, when you send them to the first one, I think the first camp that she went to was science camp. And, oh, man, was she mad at me? I remember getting her in the car like, I hate this. This is so stupid. You make me do this. Boom, door slam. She goes in, comes out. That was awesome. What are we doing next year? It's great. Yeah. It's really great. That's fun. And now, you know, I'm looking at her today coming into her again, a non-traditional womanly role into the architectural for, field because of that. So I think I, I believe you're, I think, there's so much opportunity out there, and I wish that yeah. our universities would do a better job of expanding it to women to every role and giving them the opportunity to go into entrepreneurship, into financial advising, into architecture, into engineering, and everything else instead of just saying teaching, education, right. whatever it may be, right. nursing. And, you know, we look at – I am blessed that I have a whole bunch of really rock star women girlfriends that – if you look at them, they're all leaders in their groups. We have this group that Joanna started called the Broads Network. And I just look at it as it's just a group of friends getting together. But outwardly, people are like, how do you get into that group? I want to be, what a powerful group of women. And to us, we're just like, we're just each, like we've known each other forever. We're just people, you know. Um, and recently, I, I was asked to go um, be on a panel for Terso and ProMega to encourage, uh, to talk about mentorship for women in their organizations in their leadership roles. Uh, and I've had so many people reach out, hey, could we meet? Could you mentor me on this? And what I think is just, this is what everybody does. This is just normal. I'm realizing out in the, because you know, what we have is all we know. Mm -hmm. I think everybody's mm -hmm. just like me. And when you go do something like that and people reach out, you realize we're doing something different. And it's just, you know, my friends are all rock stars. And so we all just think we're normal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, so what you're doing is being advocates for each other. Yeah. And yeah. that's that's the power in your group and what what others want is the reason Joanna, you know, introduced what well, we knew each other before, but wanted yeah. you to get on this podcast with me is like you're a powerful woman and she's a powerful woman and you guys are advocating for each other. Yep. Like, hey, get this out there, get each other out there, promote yeah. each other. Yeah. And I think back to your what you call as mentors at Powder Lawson, they were really your sponsors. Yeah. And so for what a lot of women need and what's coming out more is is all mentorship is good, but sponsorship is better. Yeah. Is promoting you in whatever field or endeavor you're trying to do or in whatever community. So yeah. instead of um, in a lot of uh, whether it's minority or whether it's uh, 
um, women versus men, like the crab analogy is usually pull each other down because you have a scarcity, like there's only so much success. Yeah. Well, there's not. Everyone's entitled to success. What we need to do is be promoting each other and have the abundance mentality. And so that sponsorship is really key. Yeah. And that's what I think those mentors really did for you. That's changed over yeah. the years. Way back when um, I realized early on I didn't, ended up not having a lot of girlfriends because they didn't, it was the crab mentality. So it just seemed natural in a male dominant industry that most of my friends were men. It's just in the last 10 years that we've become really close and supportive because we're all get, everybody gets it now. Yeah. And that, so I think you're right. There's a, uh, whether it's the Me Too movement or, or others or just awareness as a whole, I think more and more women are supporting each other. And I think more and more men that are advocating for women are really helping at least change the tide. Yeah. You know, you're right. And then for me, and I've talked about this often, but like I continue to talk to powerful women because I'm raising three daughters. I want to make sure that I give them the opportunity and they see whether it's this industry or architecture or any yeah. other industry as just as much of an opportunity to have success as I had. Yep. So that's uh, that's my why behind it all. Sure. It'd be interesting to see if one of your girls takes over when you leave. Be great if they Wouldn't did. Wouldn't that be awesome? Yeah. And be, uh, you know, again, that's Northwestern's decision, not yep. mine. But right. uh, my, my job is to raise them up to be whoever they want to be and, yep. and go from there. So, yeah, that would be fun, though. And I tell them all the time. So not one of them, even when Jenna or I ask, uh, say, what do you want to be when you grow up? Not one has mentioned financial advisor or, or leader yet. But, uh, but every day I drop them off at school and say, be a leader today. So we'll see. So I don't tell them. And that's one thing. I was like, I never tell them to be good. That was one thing I learned in reading about some of the gender stuff and differences between raising boys and girls is, uh, you know, when boys are rambunctious, we say, oh, they're boys being boys. When girls are like that, or they're, they're acting, they're misbehaving. And we tell them to be good and perfect and whatever. And so they attach themselves to those outcomes. And, and so I, I tell them, you know, be a leader today and I love you. And that's what I say when I drop them off. So lucky ho girls, hopefully, well, thanks. But hopefully that continues to, to work and instill in them that that's not about being perfect. It's yeah. about, you know, being a leader and, and being respectful and treating others how they want to be treated. Right. So, so closing up here, um, at the end of the day, you've talked a lot about caring about your team. You've talked a lot about uh, respect and trust uh, in your culture um, and your, and your uh, team being happy makes your clients happy and, and empowering them. And talking about it, and communication is key. So I know one of the things you mentioned beforehand was your favorite book. What was that again? Yeah, uh, Thou Shalt Prosper. Prosper by Rabbi Levine. And what made that book so impactful for you? Um, it really helped me get out of my own way with reading Reading that book. It teaches you education is really important. Relationships are really important. And it's okay to get paid an honest wage for the hard work that you do. And what? So that last point there, you've mentioned that twice now. Yep. Why was that so important? Yep. I always... Uh, Early on in my career, I always felt, oh, I have to be the lowest to get this job, not that we were the absolute best. And it was oftentimes our clients, they'd hire us and they'd say, you know, you were quite a bit lower, which when your client's telling you that, you're kind of like, oh, like, that damn hurts. It. Like <laughs> yeah, that really hurts. But what I heard, and it took me a while, is they really valued the services that we were doing. And so, you know, we have to be competitive or we won't get any work. But... Um, we're, we are much more competitive now. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting you say that. So I'm going through a, on a personal story, a, a slight uh, remodel for our, for our son to have a bedroom. And we got three bids. One of them was exorbitant. And uh, so you talk about, you know, charging what you're worth, but this one was so out of the, like construction costs are through the roof right now, as you know. Yeah. But so like, they're, they're, I guess they're asking for an amount that says, well, um, we can get it. So either you pay it or not. And they're like, but to me, the other bids were more reasonable, two of the three. I'm like, I'm going to remember that you were trying to overcharge me right. and speak badly about you in the future. So right. it's like that happy medium from not being the lowest, knowing your value and your worth, but also not trying to rake people over the coals just because you can. Right. right now either. Yeah, that goes back to r reputation and relationships. You're always going to remember that that guy tried to guide, gouge you because he could. And what does that do? Yeah. Nothing. 
Except you might tell other people, don't go to this guy. He's really not good. Yeah. <laughs> so it was just an interesting experience. I think I mentioned it a couple of times now because um, I'm not, and again, I'm never going to throw anyone under the bus, but it's like that, that was just, is it just because you can doesn't mean you should. Right. So it's not fair. Yeah. So how can our listeners get in touch with you? So you can reach me at bethp at potterlawson.com or call our office 274-2741. It's an easy number. It Very is. similar to my childhood number, the 274 to start with, but uh, I haven't had to use that in a long time. So we want to remind our listeners, uh, follow us on Instagram at Josh Kosnick. Uh, and Facebook. But uh, if you haven't subscribed to the show, please do on iTunes and Spotify, and you'll get uh, updates weekly. But hopefully you got a lot out of Beth today. She was awesome. Thank you for being on the show. Uh, she was nervous today and you did a great job. <laughs> Never done a podcast before. No, Didn't she do great? No. So <laughs> they're good. We're not going to have to add anything, even that uh, bad word you used. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we go. everybody have a great week.